the modern Prometheus. <coughs> Prometheus, as you probably remember from your classical education, was a titan. The titans were the parents of the gods of Olympus, the gods of Olympus led by Zeus. And Zeus decided to abolish the titans. There was a huge battle, a huge war. You probably remember this. There was a war, I do. There was a war between <laughs> the titans and the Olympians. And the Olympians won. And the titans were banished to Tartarus, the lowest level of hell. Except for two of them. Prometheus and Epimetheus. Two brothers who had decided to switch sides rather cleverly in the midst of the battle. And Prometheus and Epimetheus were rewarded by Zeus by allowing them to form humanity. They formed humanity out of clay, so the myth goes. Prometheus, I'm sure you remember from your ancient Greek, means forethought, Prometheus. Epimetheus, his brother, afterthought. I'm thinking that's like when you have two kids, isn't it? You know, the first one is planned, <laughs> and the second one isn't. And it's a kind of ancient Greek joke, which is nice, nice to know that they were actually humorists as well. Anyway, Prometheus, <laughs> Prometheus formed humankind out of clay and then decided that he should give us something. And he said to Zeus, look, we need to give the humans something. And, and Zeus said, no, they need to be subservient to us. They need to worship the gods. We're not going to give them anything. So Prometheus stole fire. He stole fire from Mount Olympus and he brought it down to earth and gave it to us. He gave us fire, he gave us knowledge, and he gave us enlightenment. Zeus was not happy when he found out about this, so he took Prometheus and he took him to a rock in the Caucasus. He chained him to the rock and he called down an eagle to eat his liver. <laughs> it's good that, Alvin, isn't it? It's a good one. <laughs> so he called down an eagle to eat his liver. Prometheus was immortal, of course. He was a, a titan. He was immortal. So overnight, the liver regenerated and the next day, the eagle came back. He was in perpetual torment. Pretty neat punishment. Interestingly, and I found this out only a couple of days ago, that is exactly the same punishment as is dished out by the CAPS Ethics Committee for plagiarism. <laughs> Without the liver regeneration. So it's even worse. You've been warned. Anyway, we're going to leave Prometheus there for a moment. Okay, we'll come back. He'll be, he'll be okay. He's immortal. He's fine because I want to tell you about a bit of family history. Uh, when my daughter Ellie was 14, uh, she wanted to do some family history, so we went on the Ancestry website, Ancestry.com, we went on uh, FamilySearch.com, the Mormon website, and we looked up our family history. We knew there was a family legend about a famous writer, and we wanted to find out more about it, and we did. We found out more about it. We found out who she was. I'm going to, she's my sixth great aunt. I'll call her Aunt M for now. Aunt M was born in 1797, in Somerstown in London, about three miles from where I live now. Uh, her mother, unfortunately, died in childbirth, died giving birth to her, so she was brought up by her father, my sixth great grandfather. Brought up by her father, and when she was 16, in the year 1814, she took up with a married man. I know. See, nowadays it's not great when you're 16 to take up with a married man. In 1814, it was really bad. But she did, and her father threw her out of the house. And as a result, she ended up traveling with this married man. They went across to France. They, they traveled around. She even wrote a book about it, which I've read. And it's, it's a very good little book. It's a little travelogue. And they came back, tried to get back in the house. He still wouldn't let them in. So eventually they left and they found themselves a place to rent in Switzerland on the shores of a lake. And as you do when you have a place somewhere else, you know, a place in the country or a place overseas, they invited some friends. They invited her stepsister to come over. Uh, they invited her stepsister's boyfriend, which I suppose you have to do, and they invited somebody up from Italy, a friend of theirs, and they had a bit of a house party. And they were there for months. They were there for six months. And they used to sit round the fire, round the lake. They used to make a little fire, and they used to tell each other stories. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to leave them here for a moment. Is that okay with you? So I'm going to leave this little fire here, and they're all sitting around the fire telling stories. We'll come back to them later on. Now, some people are saying he's doing that NLP thing, isn't he? <laughs> What he's doing, you see what he did there? He's doing that NLP thing where he kind of put a story there and he'd put another story over here. I've no idea how NLP works. So I'm not doing the NLP thing. And somebody else is saying, but he's going the timeline. He's going the timeline the wrong way. I don't know. I have no clue about all this. It's been a complete mystery my entire speaking career, but I got away with it. 
What I wanted to talk to you about were the five elements, the five tenets of reputation, how you can maintain a global reputation. Some of you will know my clients tend to be luxury hotels. Why is that? Because I choose the damn clients, frankly. <laughs> we can, you can. This is a bit of a revelation, I know. You can choose the people you work with. I like to stay in luxury hotels. They're great. And I was working in the luxury hotel in Dubai, that one that looks like a sail, you know, the Burj Al Arab. Brilliant hotel. The world's only seven-star hotel. Or is it? <laughs> it's not, is it, children? Because they called it that. There is no such thing as a seven-star hotel. It's a five-star hotel. And the marketing manager, in a fit of genius, said, let's call it the world's only seven-star hotel. And journalists like me refer to it like that all over the world. How crazy are we? But he got away with it. But that's not what the story's about. So I was there. I was emceeing a conference for an American software company called EMC Squared for a relatively good fee. You'll get that joke later on. You're, when you, you're going to wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> and you're going to suddenly laugh and you'll realize what happened there. Okay? Or just, if you get it, just tell the person next to you. I'm used to that. That's fine. Anyway, I'm working for this company, EMC Squared. And I'm working with a guy called Ricardo Semler. If you don't know Ricardo, he's a brilliant uh, Brazilian businessman. He's now lecturing at Harvard. And he wrote a book called Maverick. Fantastic book. Anyway, Ricardo and I, as you do, at the end of the first day, we repaired to the bar. And if you know that hotel, there is a bar across the top, which is actually a bar. I mean, it's a bar inside a bar, which is weird. And it's done out like Saturday Night Fever. You know, you know the dance floor in Saturday Night Fever? As you, you walk across it, 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 all the tiles change colour. You've seen the film. And as you walk into the bar, you've got a desperate urge to do that. <laughs> or that. You cannot help it. Everybody does it. So Ricardo and I were giving it some, going across to the bar. We had a few beers and chilled out. And then I went to my room. $2,000 a night. I'm not paying the client. We don't stay in rooms. We have to pay that sort of fee, do we? But they're paying. And I thought, this is great. I'm in a seven-star hotel on the 13th floor. 13th floor. That's okay. Now, this is something that you need to know, because none of you are my age, or very few of you. I, think, I don't think any of you are my age, really. I'm really old. Uh, when, but when you do get to my age, you have to get up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Sometimes twice. You have to go to the bathroom. Anyway, I woke up, it must have been three o'clock in the morning, needed to go to the bathroom, and uh, I looked over to the window that was overlooking the gulf. I thought, oh, what a beautiful view that will be in the morning, and I realized it was a bit blurry, and I thought, well, I'll just put the light on, just to, to see what's going, going on here. I was, I was, I'd already tried to put the light on, it hadn't worked, and I thought, well, I'll try it again. So I banged the light switch, banged the light switch, nothing happened. I thought, seven-star hotel, the light doesn't work. What is occurring here? And then I realized that I've been banging this light switch for a minute or two to try and get the damn thing to work, and I, I could see what looked like a silhouette over there, a little silhouette of a man, it was, actually. <laughs> and uh, <it's> a <laughs> Keep up. So, so I'm looking over there, and I can see a figure, and it appears to be floating towards me. There's no sound. It's just moving steadily towards it. I'm on the 13th floor. It's moving steadily towards me. Now, the, the carpets are thick. Obviously, it's a seven-star hotel. You can have a thick carpet in a hotel like that, aren't you? But it's moving towards me, and suddenly it gets here. It's about a foot away. I am frozen with fear. <laughs> I am absolutely terrified. But I'm thinking, I'm going to be murdered in a seven-star hotel. That's some headline, actually. <laughs> and for a media guy, that's not a bad way to go. But anyway, the guy gets here. He's looking at me. And he said, can I help you? I said, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and he said, certainly, sir. And I, I just, no, I said, hang, no, no, no. No, I don't. I honestly don't need any help. And he switched the light on. And I said, what did you just do? And I realized I've been pressing the call button <laughs> for the butler. Because all those rooms have butlers. Each, each room has uh, a butler, or each couple of rooms have a butler. Because they over-deliver on everything. You pay a lot of money, but they over-deliver. Principle one, you, you know what to get there eventually, over-deliver. <laughs> Got that? You've got to over-deliver. That's what, that's what makes a great reputation. Second luxury hotel, let's talk about the Beverly Hills Hotel. One of my clients, I got a phone call 
Good Friday four years ago from Ed Mady, who's the gen, you know Ed, that's, good, that's where you go when you're in the Polo Lounge, you know, you sit, I've seen a lot of you there, you sit there and you talk to Ed, he phoned me on Good Friday and I thought, he's phoning to wish me happy Easter, what a great client. But he wasn't. He said, Alan, um, outside the hotel here in Beverly Hills, we've got about 100 people with placards. Some of them are what you might term celebrities. We've got Jay Leno, we've got uh, Sharon Osbourne, we've got Ellen DeGeneres waving placards and stopping people coming into the hotel and saying, boycott the Beverly Hills. And I said, oh, that's unfortunate. Ed. He said, we've got the press arriving in 30 minutes. And I said, oh. I said, that is a bit of a problem. He said, yes, it is, Alan. It's a problem for you because you're our crisis management consultant and you've got to tell me what to say. Why were they stopping people coming into the hotel? Because the Sultan of Brunei is the ultimate owner of the Beverly Hills Hotel through the Dorchester Collection and he brought in a law that said that gay and lesbian people were going to be stoned to death in Brunei. There is no excuse. There's no way of excusing that. And I'm now going to come up with a press statement that says why people shouldn't boycott the Beverly Hills Hotel. What would you have done? You'd have put the phone down, wouldn't you? But I get paid to do this sort of thing, so I know what to do. So I said to him, Ed, um, not a problem. What you need to do is to say it's a government issue. It's a government-to-government issue. Uh, anyone who's affected by the boycott will be American workers. They won't be hurting the people. And, and as far as the Sultan of Brunei is concerned, this is a very small business. It's not going to affect him. So that's what they did, did a press statement. What's the point of all that? It was an instant rebuttal. So the second tenet of reputation management is instant rebuttal. You need to get on the case immediately and you need to say something. No comment is never an option. If anything happens and you say no comment, a newspaper can legitimately print, whoever you are, refuse to deny that your company is about to go bankrupt. Because you did refuse to deny it, you didn't say anything. You said no comment. So no comment's never an option, you need to respond instantly. That's the second one. So we've got an O and we've got an I. What have we got, Alvin? O and an I. Good man. Good. I want to talk about uh, one of my heroes now. My dad, actually. My dad was one of my heroes. Sadly, he died when I was nine years old. But he taught me a lot in those nine years. He taught me about photography. He was a photographer. He was an event photographer. He would have been here. He would have been at an event like this, photographing the event. And what he used to do, he used to go to an event, whether it's a wedding or a, or a big uh, anniversary event, and he would photograph everyone who was there. He'd get on his Norton motorbike, he would zoom home, he would stop his bike outside, he would jump over the front gate, straight through the front door, upstairs where I was waiting in the dark room. This is great, because this looks like a dark room. It does. <laughs> I'm getting all nostalgic thinking about this, because you get red lights and you get darkness, and you don't do that with digital photography anymore, which is a real shame. But I was in the dark room, I got the smell of fixer, I can still smell it, the Rattan OB red light, which is what these lights look like here. And I would help him get the film out of the camera, we had film in those days, film, <laughs> and we had to develop pictures, and there is nothing, I tell you, there is nothing more magical than seeing a picture develop in the 10 seconds in the developer, before you take that out and put it in the stop bath and the fixer and then go and wash it, it's brilliant. And I used to do all of that. And then he used to go, he'd get all the proofs, he'd jump over the front gate again. So one thing he taught me, obviously, was that you can jump over a front gate, which is quite useful, except on one occasion he missed, and I had to, I had to cycle back to the, uh, to the wedding with the proofs. So, you know, it's not, not such a smart thing to do. Anyway, he taught me my love of photography, and I always wanted to meet uh, a secondary hero, who was a man called Henri Cartier-Bresson. I realise there are some French speakers in the room, so I'll try that again. Henri Cartier-Bresson, that's not even close, is it? But never mind, you know who I mean. <laughs> he was the founder of the Magnum Photography Group. An absolutely brilliant man, came up with a, a brilliant concept. I always wanted to meet him. He died a few years ago in France in his 90s, never got to meet him. But I'm a member of the Photographer's Gallery in London, and I realized there was a Magnum photographer coming in, a man called Elliot Erwitt, a New York street photographer, who was a contemporary of Henri Cartier-Bresson. I said it badly again, but never mind. He was coming to the photographer's gallery, and I thought, I must go and meet the guy. He was doing a book signing, and I thought, well, I'll get there really early. The book signing was midday. I got there at 9 o'clock in the morning to be at the front of the queue. It worked. There was nobody else there. I went into the cafe, sat down, had a cup of coffee, a bit of toast. 10 o'clock, still nobody there. About 10.30, somebody else arrived. Another man walked in, sat at the far end. I thought, well, I might as well go and have a chat. He's obviously a photography buff like me. So I went over and talked to him. I said, um, are you here for the Elliot Erwitt signing? He said, I am. 
And I said, it's funny, there's only two of us here. He said, it's even funnier than that, I am Elliot Irwin. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the chance, eh? Anyway, so, I, so we, we chatted, it was lovely. Nobody else came, nobody else arrived. I was astonished that nobody else arrived. So we sat for an hour and a half and we talked about Cartier-Bresson and we talked about photography. And I said, did uh, Cartier-Bresson ever teach you anything? And he said, he did actually. And he came up with uh, this phrase. He said, learn the tools and seize the moment. And I thought, well, that applies to anything, doesn't it? Basically, you learn the tools and seize the moment. It's what we do. It's what, it's what our business is. But he also talked about the decisive moment. Because Cartier-Bresson never worked in the darkroom at all. He used to crop a shot as he saw it. He took the shot, he printed the shot as he saw it, and he waited until the decisive moment before he pressed the shutter. So the third element of reputation management is opportunism. Still with me, Alvin? Okay. O-I-O. -O. Good man. We're there. Another hero of mine, because I've got a journalistic background, was a man called Alistair Cook. Uh, Alistair Cook produced a show called Letter from America, uh, which some of you may remember, some of you may not. Letter from America ran for over 50 years. It was a 15-minute show, and in the UK it was on a quarter to nine on a Saturday morning, and even from the age of seven, I would sit by the radio. I'm a bit of a nerd, a bit of a media nerd, as you've guessed by now. I would sit by the radio at quarter to nine every Saturday morning and listen to a letter from America. A wonderful man. I met him several times. He, he mentored me a little bit. Uh, his, his philosophy was that you should never miss a deadline and never waste a word. And I thought, if you're, if you're ever into journalism, do that. Never miss a deadline, never waste a word. You'll be fine. But he used to produce this show, and if you ever get the chance, it's on the BBC website, and there's an archive piece of audio where he was actually in the kitchen where Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. He was, he was shot himself uh, in, the, uh, in the incident there and ended up in hospital and actually recorded his show in hospital for two weeks in a row because he never missed, never missed a show. And it's an extraordinary piece of journalism. I'd urge you to listen to it. And from that, as my little homage to Alistair Cook, what I did was to start 14 years ago a regular web radio show, I think I mentioned it on Facebook the other day, a web radio show in an easy, I've never missed a Friday, any of you that get the magazine will know, easy will know, never missed a Friday because Alistair Cook was my hero and I thought consistency is another one, so that is C for consistency, where are we Alvin? O-I-O-C, good man you are. I think we should go back and find out what's happening by the lake in Switzerland, do you not? <laughs> yes Alan? That's, I said it wasn't interactive, so you're okay. You didn't have to say anything, because I did, I did warn you at the start. Anyway, here they are. They're sitting around the, the campfire by Lake Geneva, as it happens. They're staying in something called the Villa Diodati on the shores of Lake Geneva. And there's my Aunt Em, there's her stepsister, uh, stepsister's boyfriend, guy from Italy, etc. And uh, they're all, they all have a competition. They decide who's going to tell the scariest story. Who can write the scariest story? They have a competition. The person who wins it is the guy from Italy. He's called John Polidori. And in 1818, John Polidori published a book called The Vampire, V-A-M-P-Y-R-E, which some 70 years later, Bram Stoker bought in a Dublin bookshop and based the myth of Dracula on it. So I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. It's a mastermind group, really, isn't it? That's what it is. It's a mastermind group. And what they've done, someone's come up with a book idea, They've all kind of helped it go, and he's published the book, and it's gone very well. Didn't John Polidori didn't make a, any money from it at all, Bram Stoker. Took, but that's the way it goes, isn't it? <laughs> Somebody steals your idea, off they go. But anyway, Aunt Em wrote uh, a book, and her book was placed second. So she decided when she came back to the UK, bear in mind she was only 18 years old at the time, only 18, and she'd written a book, brought it back to the UK, and tried to get it published. And guess what? Because she was a woman, nobody would publish it. She went to publisher after publisher after publisher. Nobody would publish it. So in the end, they published it anonymously. They published it anonymously, but they had a preface written by her married lover, whose name was Percy Bysshe Shelley. So everyone thought he'd written the book, which I think is pretty outrageous. How, how did he let that happen, frankly? I'd have given her a slap with a wet fish if I'd have been Aunt M, but she didn't. She stayed with him. The book was published. It was such a success that she was forced, or they, they actually forced, to, forced her to find out if she could publish it under her own name. She did. She was Mary Shelley, obviously, uh, published Frankenstein. So Frankenstein and the precursor of Dracula came from the same little mastermind group, uh, that's, which is quite cool. So the two, you know, two of our... Iconic horror stories appeared on the same night.
from the same place. And my sixth grade aunt was involved. And the subtitle of Frankenstein, as I'm sure you know, is the modern Prometheus. Because Prometheus, as I told you a little bit earlier on, is the bringer of life. Are you paying attention here? Good man, Alvin. It's useful to have you in the front, actually. It really is. I can see the light reflecting off your head. That's how I can keep an eye on you. It's really handy. So Prometheus, the, the bringer of life, is Victor Frankenstein in the book. So she calls it the modern Prometheus because Victor Frankenstein is the modern Prometheus. He creates life from lifeless tissue. Now, here's a threat, okay? I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people in the East End of London. They are powerful people and they can do some damage. So, if I find any of you, and I mean this seriously, any one of you referring to the monster as Frankenstein, I will find you and I will send these people after you. The monster is not Frankenstein. Very strong on this. The monster has no name. The book is about Victor Frankenstein. And if you read the book, you'll find out that the film, Frankenstein, is only a tiny, teeny part. It's like Hollywood, isn't it? It's only a tiny part of what's in the book. It's a great book. You should read it. Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And I think the value that comes out here is persistence. Because she went to publisher after publisher after publisher. She persisted. So that's P. So what have we got, Alvin? O-I-O-C-P. Oi, Jakob because it doesn't always make a word. <laughs> See what I did there? I just, I just used the proper names of the things I'm talking about. I know that's unusual in our business, so what we've got is oyokup, the five tenets of reputation management. It's the way it works. We need to... Um, we need to go back and find out what happened to Prometheus. We've left him chained to a rock over here. He's immortal, so he's okay. So Prometheus, he was there for several... He was in eternal... Well, he wasn't in eternal torment. It was several centuries in. So that's quite, quite bad, isn't it? Hercules... You remember Hercules? I do. Hercules, he had various labours that he had to do. And one of the things he did was to go and rescue Prometheus from the rock. He unchained him from the rock and restored him to life, and he lived happily ever after, somewhere or other, which is rather sweet. Nice man, Hercules. However, there remains a question, at least in my head, if not in yours, probably only in mine, so I'm going to share it with you. Who is the modern Prometheus? I mean, I've told you some stories about Prometheus. I've told you about Mary's Prometheus. Who is the modern Prometheus? Who brings fire... Who brings knowledge and who brings enlightenment? Who shapes ideas and gives them form? You do. You do. Because you are the modern Prometheus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.